So thank you very much, Javier, for that uh, very nice introduction. And I really appreciate the invitation to come to this conference. Uh, um, I've known about it for several years, uh, and I'm glad to be able to spend some time here with all of you and to, uh, and to forge more links with the South American uh, society that does patristics. Uh, so I'm thrilled to be here. So I plan to speak for about probably 45 minutes, um, and that means that I'll be skipping over some parts of the paper, uh, because as I practiced it these past few days, I realized it was a bit too long. And, and so so I really do want to have some kind of feedback and some discussion after the paper. Um, so I hope that parts that, that I'm skipping over are easy to notice in the text above me here. Um, so. With that said, Pavadius of Agen is the earliest of a handful of these lesser known Western theologians who helped articulate a Latin tradition of a Trinitarian theology in the second half of the fourth century. So Michel Barnes has called these, these theologians the other Latin Nicenes in order to distinguish them from figures like Hillary and Ambrose, because their Trinitarian theologies were shaped in very significant ways by what, what was going on in the East at that time. So these are the Greek currents. Um, only a single writing of Apodius, um survives. It's called the Contra Arianos, and that was written against the so-called um, the second sermon of formula, which I'll abbreviate as the SSF, and, um, and, and that was issued by a small gathering of bishops in, um, in Sermium in the year 357. So the Fabadius treatise is commonly dated to 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 um, late 357 or early 358. So it must be the case because it's a prompt response to the SSF. I'm going to skip this next paragraph, which talks about the traditions of the text. Um, so, so I will say though that I that I've I looked into French and English scholarship and also German scholarship, but I've not yet explored the Spanish or Italian scholarship. So if anybody knows anything. On Phobadius in Spanish or Italian, I would love to hear about it. Um, so, the, all those writers who Barth considers the other Latin Nicenes, um, uh, like, are not only explicitly sympathetic to the Council of Nicaea, but they also endorse these these um, three key Latin doctrines. Now, these three Latin doctrines are both inherited from earlier third century Latin writers like Tertullian, and they also appear in a Western creed of Sertica in the year three, um, 343. So what are these three doctrines? So the, the, the first is the appeal to John 14, 10, I'm in the Father and the Father is in me, in order to support the uh co-eternity of the father and son the second doctrine is the viewing of divine power as the principle of unity between the father and son and then third is the spirit christology wherein the divine element of jesus is identified as a spirit uh, and all three of these key three latin doctrines are found in phobadius uh, and, uh, and so what I'm going to do today is to explore how Fabadius actually uses these three key doctrines. So I actually have time to only discuss the first two, so, so I'm not going to talk much about the spirit Christology. Uh, so in themselves, like these doctrines are not necessarily Nicene because they actually predate the Council of Nicaea, and they're found in the third century authors like Tertullian, Novation, and others. So what I want to do is I want to analyze 
powerful body is kind of uh, um, redeploys and he repurposes these these um, a traditional anti-monarchian Latin doctrines in order to ex express an anti-Aryan Canisian doctrine of God. He's making a big, a big, a big, a big transposition, as it were. Um, the sense of body is, is the earliest of the other Latin Nicenes. It's his articulation of Nicene theology, which marks the birth of Latin Nicene theology. So that's the claim that I'm making in this paper here. So, so, so the first section, substance. Um, Fobai is considered the SSF to be a deceptive attempt to reassert Arianism. And the opening paragraph of, of the Contra Arianos reveals that the treatise is as much a repudiation of the Arian heresy in the SSF as it is an attempt to reestablish the true Catholic faith. So what is the, the true Catholic faith according to Fabadius? Well, so, so he identifies as the Nicene faith. So this is done at a number of points in the treatise, but the most clear indication of this is in the statement that the Nicene Creed is, quote, the perfect rule of the Catholic faith, end quote. <clears throat> now, in spite of his identification of the Catholic faith and the Nicene faith, in the treatise, he actually rarely mentions the Nicene Creed, and he never appeals <laughs> to its famous phrases and its key terms, like Homoousius in his theological arguments. So, then for Prabhadis, it is possible to express the Nicene faith without quoting or, or even appealing to the Creed of Nicaea itself. So the one can speculate about the reasons for this sort of a mythology, but I think that we should not expect him to have a direct recourse to the Nicene Creed, because at this early stage in the development of the pro-Nicene um, 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 Trinitarian theology, it did not yet have that function. So in this very period, in the 350s, the very idea of the purpose and the function of creeds was evolving. Uh, so the, for the earliest Latin Nicene theologians, um, fidelity to Nicaea meant actually something other than a, def a defense of the of the creed or an exposition of its articles that comes much later in the fourth century so the, i'm arguing here that being faithful to nicaea means an assistance upon the use of the term well, substance in trinitarian theology in a recent essay michelle barnes has argued that the most important contribution of the nicene creed was this turn to um, um, substance language in order to describe the the fundamental character of the Father's um, divinity all for the purpose of conceptualizing the Father's production of the Son in relationship um, and relationship between them according to a substance-based um, logic. The key phrase of the Nicene Creed, that the Son was begotten from the Father, that is, from the substance of the Father. So, so that controls how the rest of the Creed is interpreted, um, including the term homoousius, which Barnes sees as a kind of a gloss on from the substance. It was this embrace of substance language, above all, that constitutes the faith of Nicaea, well, these early Latin Nicenes, according to Barnes. So this means that one could adhere to the faith of Nicaea without appeal to Homoousius, or, like, or even the Creed itself. And this also means that those who are rejecting substance-based logic are rejecting, are rejecting Nicaea. So I find Barnes' thesis attractive for a lot of reasons, um, 
But the one which I want to focus on today is because it helps us make sense of what's going on um, in Fabadius and how he is committed to, to, to Nicaea. So his explicit identification of the Nicene faith as a true, as a true Catholic faith is made it is made in the context um, of proclaiming that the SSF um, has overturned a Nicene faith. So so is that so is the SSF um, proscription of substance language. And that reveals to Phobadius the the full extent of his anti nicene polemics. Um, Phobadius equates the prohibition of the substance language with an attack on the Nicene faith itself. So the, for Phobadius, conceptualizing the relationship between the father and the son, according to a substance-based logic is what it means to be Nicene. So let's look at some text here. So, so, so it's helpful to begin with how Probatius understands the SSF's um, proscription of, of substance language. So the actual prohibition reads, quote, since some or many people are troubled over substance, um, substantia, which is termed usia in Greek, um, and, and that is to understand the matter more precisely, the the homo usian, or what is called the homo usian, um, um, there ought to be no mention of these at all, nor ought anyone affirm these, and for this reason and on this ground, that they are not contained in the divine scriptures and that they are above human knowledge. <laughs> and the quote goes on. So then Phobadius um, succinctly paraphrases this whole prohibition as, quote, let no one say one substance, nice and short. So the elimination of, of substance language means that it can no longer be said that, that the father and son have a single substance. So accordingly, Fabadia says that the SFF rejects substance language in order to separate the son from the father. So this promotes, so, so this actually promotes the teaching of the Arians, he says, that the father and son are two different um, are two different and unequal substances each of which has his own proper characteristics with the son's um, substance having been made from nothing. It is clear that Phobadius conceives of God's um, substance quite differently from the SFF and the Arians. So he offers a definition of substance. Quote, for Substance it, it is what we call that which always exists on its own. In other words, it is that which substances in itself by its own power. This strength pertains to the one and only God. Uh, so then substance, according to Definir, uh, is defining uh, divine substance, right? So the, for Fabadius then, the substance communicates these, these, these two essential properties of God, non-contingence and eternity. So the note that he is uninterested in defending the technical term Moussian or or, 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 or Moussian. So next section, uh, on power. So the concept of substance can be expressed with other terms. Um, um, Fabadius writes, by the term substance, it is signified either power 
or divinity. End quote. So, so let's start with power. So when for bodies paraphrases the SSF prescription of substance language, uh, so where he says, says, let no one say one substance, he immediately offers a, a second paraphrase, quote, let, um, let no one in the church proclaim that there is one power of the Father and the Son, end quote. So here, <laughs> substance and power are basically interchangeable. The prohibition of the substance of the substance-based language is interpreted as a prohibition of power-based language as well. Uh, and a little after this, he justifies treating substance and power as equivalent terms. And quote, we say, uh, so we also say that there is one power in both. In regard to this, the same apostle says, Christ is the power of God. And indeed, to, to, this power, since it needs no external assistance, is called substance. Because, as we said above, it owes whatever it is only to itself. So this quotation of... Oops, So the Fabadius roots the claim that the Father and Son share a single substance and power in 1 Corinthians 1.24, so where Paul calls Christ the power of God. So this quotation not only provides the scriptural basis for the use of power language, but, but it furthermore implies that the SFFs prohibition actually contradicts scripture. In any event, the conceptual synonymy of power and substance seems even further indicated by his definition of power, so which is essentially the same as his definition of substance. So his definition of substance was, um, oh, this is, yeah, sorry, this is definition of power. This power since it needs no external assistance, is called substance because, as we said above, it owes whatever it is only to itself. So, like substance, power also conveys also conveys um, 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 non contingency. So, this conceptual unity between power and substance is such that his own definition of substance, as is mentioned above actually includes the word power. So, so we'll just repeat that. So when substance is that which always exists on its own, in other words, it, it is that which subsists in itself by its own power. So the word power is used in the very addition of substance. So, so the few scholars like who have studied for bodies have noted the oddness of his inability to, like, to make a really clear distinction between substance and power. So Michelle Barnes has called this sort of a power-based theology in this passage of Abadius co-natural because it conceptualizes the divine power as coextensive with the divine nature. So there's one divine power in the Father and Son possess this one power equally. So, so, uh, uh, so then just as they have one divine power, so too they have one divine nature and one divine substance. Thus, the single power is a principle of unity before the Father and the Son. So Barnes actually considers the, uh, the use of a connatural power-based theology in the Arian contribute. In the Arian controversy as a hallmark of the Latin pronunci, um as a hallmark of of Latin pronouncing theology because it retrieves an earlier Latin tradition and is not found in, in, in earlier Greek century uh, in, in earlier fourth century Greek writers um, such such as Athanasius. 
So the Christopher body is, is the first fourth century Latin theologian in whom a co-natural power-based account of God appears, appears in the context of writing against Arianism. He is in the vanguard of the Latin Parnassian tradition. However, Fabadius also uses another kind of a power-based theology, which Barnes calls hypostatic. It, so this version exists alongside conatural power-based theology in many authors, even if it is not entirely uh, uh, consistent with it. In hypostatic power-based theology, it is the Son who is identified specifically as the power of God, again on the basis of 1 Corinthians 124. Here, once again, there is a single power of God, but rather than it being a principle of unity shared equally by the Father and the Son, the Son is the power of God, and at the same time, God the Father has or possesses this power. So the power of God has a distinct hypostatic existence while simultaneously it's united with the Father as his very own power. In Fabadius' version of this hypostatic power-based theology, the Son, it, the Son is God's the Father's own power, and the Father is never without his own proper power. The way that Fabadius expresses this is that the Father is... is is the source of the son's power. So the what are these powers? So he so he lists them. They are word, wisdom, um, sorry, word, wisdom, reason, power, and spirit. So, so so it's a little confusing here because he speaks of the he speaks of the kind of multiple powers that the father has, but then power. It, it, is one of those powers. So, so, so that's one of the problems here with Fabadius. Anyway, uh, so the Fabadius says that the Father could not be called God if he lacked these five powers. So, what these powers name are the essential divine properties of the Father, which simultaneously have a distinct hypostatic existence as the Son. For this reason, Fabadius calls the Son the 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 fullness of God's powers. So, so just as the Father would not be God if he lacked any of these powers, so too the Son would not would not be God um, if he himself were not all these powers in their fullness. Okay, I'm going to skip down to the, the next section on uh, di um, divinity. So the other term that is equivalent to, to substance, according to Vivadius, is divinity. So saying that, quote, Um, quote, there's one substance of the Father means that there is equal riches of the one divinity in both, end quote. In practice, however, Phobadius uses divinity much less frequently than either substance or power in order to conceptualize the, the, the principle of unity between the Father and the Son. He speaks of a community of divinity, of divinity that is shared by Father and Son, and he affirms that the fullness of the same divinity as the Father is also in the Son. Uh, but otherwise, the term actually does little analytical work for him, as he prefers the concepts of power and substance in order to discuss God in more detail, in order to discuss the uh, divine unity in more detail. As a scriptural proof 
for the claim that one substance means equal riches of the one divinity, um, um, Vladia cites Colossians 1.27, which states that God has made known the riches of his glory, which is Christ. So the Fabadius equates the 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 the, the riches of, of the one divinity with the riches of God's glory. So there must be a connection in Fabadius' mind be, between divinity and glory. He so but he never specifies this, but perhaps the glory is the kind of totality. Of, of divine riches, and insofar as Saint Paul identifies Christ with this glory, so open the body must take it that the same glory is in both the Father and the Son. Elsewhere, the body speaks of these riches as goods. So when he affirms that the Son is equal to the Father in terms of all the goods of the divine glory, so they are equal in terms of these goods because the Son possesses the same goods that the Father possesses. So here's a quote. For begotten from the un unbegotten, the Son was born with all those goods of the divine glory that were in possession of the unbegotten. End quote. So there seem to be two distinct logics operative here in Fabadius's use of glory, and these are akin to the hypostatic and the connatural uses of power. On the one hand, Christ is identified as, as God's glory, as in the use of Colossians 1.27. But on the other hand, the glory is something that the Father and Son share equally, making it a principle of unity. In, in any event, this co-natural understanding of glory appears elsewhere uh, in the treatise when the body is, says that when the father and son share a single substance it means quote that there is in both um with equal truth a common honor dignity glory power and majesty end quote so the glory is one of the, so the glory is one of the divine properties that's possessed equally by the Father and the Son, along with honor, dignity, power, and majesty. So here he puts honor, dignity, glory, and majesty um, on the same level as power. In other words, if it appears that for the body is a logical consequence of the Father and Son having one substance, one power, or one divinity is that, quote, there is in both, with equal truth, a common honor, dignity, power, glory, and majesty. Actually, Fabadius does not speak much of dignity as something that the Father and Son share, but honor, glory, and majesty each play a prominent role um, in his account of divine unity. So this is due at least in part to the fact that the SFF had interpreted John 14.28 that the Father is greater than I as meaning that the Father was greater than the Son in quote, in honor, dignity, glory, majesty, and in the very name of Father, end quote. So the Papadio, Papadius treats honor, dignity, glory, and, and majesty uh, um, as roughly synonymous. For example, he refutes, he refutes the SSS claim that the Father is it greater than the Son in honor, glory, dignity, and majesty by quotation of uh, um, of John five twenty three, that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. So the so so the scriptural testimony only only uses the word honor, but it is employed to from the equal honor and glory. To, 
dignity and majesty of the Father and the Son. Elsewhere in the treatise, he uses glory and majesty um, um, interchangeably. So the following passage rehearses the logic for a single majesty of the Father and the Son. Quote, um, um, for everything that is God is dissolved in Christ if another majesty is attributed to him. And he will have another majesty if it is in majesty that the Father is greater than I. Indeed, the sense this majesty it is one, so that is of the one God, it, it cannot be not perfect. But for imperfect implies unequal and the majesty is unequal if it is less in the other so that i would imagine that the same logic would work for, for honor glory and dignity as well okay so next section on divine perfection so the above quotation reveals how the concept of, of divine perfection undergirds his account of divine unity. He affirms that the Father and Son are perfect, and this shared perfection is related to the fact that the Son's birth from the Father is perfect. So he writes, quote, Even though he was born, the Son is not imperfect, since he was born from the, from the perfect one. Nor was the one who begot him could diminish, since he begot him from his very self. But for whole gave whole, so that in the power of the Spirit, there might be whole in whole. So, end quote. So, the Fabadius understands divine perfection as as not lacking anything that God ought to possess, or or as being complete and whole, according to what it means to be God the Father or God the Son. So this understanding of divine perfection is laid out elsewhere when Fabadius explains that the Father could not be called the Father if he lacked his powers that were mentioned before, so the namely word, wisdom, reason, power, and spirit. He begins, quote, um, For not only God, who is perfect in his eternity, but indeed not even any creature would, would continue to exist if it were incomplete according to its own kind. Um, for it cannot be what it is if that does not exist, and it will not be, be what it is if it lacks what it ought to be. So that last sentence, you really got to get your mind around that one. <laughs> um, so the here for bodies supplies a kind of general definition of perfection. So, 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 so existing as a perfect thing means being complete and whole and not lacking anything according to what it means to be that entity. So the same definition holds for God. God only exists as God because God is complete and lacks nothing of what God ought to be. So the Fabadis continues, quote, Therefore the Father lacks the whole of anything, if anything from that whole is lacking. And the Father lacks something from that whole, if his own Son, that is the fullness of his powers, Um, does not lack a beginning. So, end quote. So, so the here for bodies is countering the implication in the SSF that the sun has a beginning. So that would mean that there was a point when the beginningless father lacked the sun. But this is impossible because the perfect father cannot lack anything of the whole That defines what it means for father to be father, and an integral part of that whole is the always existing son. So then what follows 
Tful Bahadia spells out the consequences of the sun not existing at some point. Quote, if it is said that the Father alone is without a beginning, we must admit that he remained imperfect until the generation of the sun. For he is imperfect if he begins to have what he did not previously have, um, um, but yet ought to have had, and furthermore, and furthermore wanted to have. And moreover, he ought, he ought to have had all those things always, since he ought to be perfect always. For the whatever already possesses the whole does not receive any addition. So, end quote. If the sun has a beginning, it means that there was a point when the beginningless father lacked the sun. And this would suggest that the father it, it, it is imperfect because, because he lacks what he ought to have. So, 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 namely the sun. But rather, as perfect God, he always possesses the whole and nothing needs to be added to him. Accordingly, divine perfection requires that the Father and Son each possess the whole of what it means to be God completely and lacking nothing. The substance, power, divinity, majesty, glory, honor, um, and uh, dignity. So the, therefore, for body is the counts of um, how these principles of unity is rooted in his understanding of divine perfection. So, mutual coherence. As I mentioned above, the shared divine perfection of the Father and Son is related to the Son's perfect birth from the Father. According to Fabadius, the perfect birth means that the Son is not only from the Father, but also in the Father. In other words, Fabadius thinks, thinks that the correct understanding of the Son's birth from the Father requires that the scriptural language of the Son being born or coming from the Father, that needs to be complemented by the scriptural language which speaks of the Son as being in the Father. So what sets the, the son's birth off from all other births is that even after coming um, from the father, he remains in the father. All others are merely from their fathers. So recall that text that I cited above. Quote, for, for, uh, for whole gave whole, so that in the power of the spirit, um, there might be whole in whole. Um, Fabadius thinks that when the Aryan authors of the SSF use, use the creedal expressions God from God, light from light, that they, quote, make another God from God, another light from light, in such a way that the Son is, is from the Father, but is not in the Father. In, in other words, he is made um, um, from God, but but not the only begotten in God. Thus, when using this <coughs> this creedal expression, quote, through, hemer um, through heretical argumentation, the Arians teach that the Son is separate from the Father and then cut off from him completely. So then therefore, affirming that the Son is not only from God, but also in God, avoids all the implications of the Aryan interpretation. But the perfect birth means not only that the Son is in the Father, but also that the Father is in the Son, as John 10, verses 9 to 10, and other verses affirm. The consequence of such language, according to Fabadius, is that it is, quote, it's impossible for the Son <laughs> not to have a whole of what belongs to the Father, since the whole of himself is in the Father, end quote. Elsewhere he writes, quote, um, for that which 
uh, after that which was from him could not have been outside of him, end quote. So the following passage like demonstrates how closely connected info bodies, his mind, are, are um, um, divine perfection and the mutual and the mutual coherence of the father and son. Quote, but um, the writers of the SFF say that the father is greater than the son, but not in terms of that difference by which a father is greater than the son, but in terms of all the goods of the divine glory. If the son is lesser in terms of these goods, he cannot be considered worthy of being in the father. <laughs> um, since the father's eternal blessedness admits nothing into his very own self, except that which is proper to God. And now nothing is proper to God, to save that which is full and complete. Then again, the Father cannot be, not be considered worthy of, of being in the Son, who is incapable of containing the whole of him. End quote. So in order to be, in order to be worthy of his mutual coherence, both the Father and Son must be all all that is proper to God in order to contain the whole of the other, a father and son must both be perfect in order for the father to be in the son and the son and the father. So, so at the end of the Contra Arianos, um, Phobadius offers a summary of the Nicene faith, which shows the central place that the mutual coherence of the father and son having his theology of God. Quote, Therefore, we must hold fast, as we said, to that rule that confesses that the Son is in the Father and the Father in the Son. That rule, uh, that, rule that preserves the, 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 the uh, one substance in two persons and acknowledges the arrangement that the divinity has. Accordingly, then, the Father is God and the Son is God because God the Son is in the Father. Ultimately, it is the Son's being in the Father and the Father in the Son that is the ground of his teaching that there is one substance, one power, and one divinity in the Father and in the Son. So this, so this concept of the mutual coherence um, seems to function as a kind of a fundamental concept or premise from which all of his other teachings about God are derived as illogical consequences. So that this may be the case is shown twice in the treatise. Well, uh, when Phobadius explicitly positions his Nicene theology God as a middle position that avoids the extremes of Sibelianism and Arianism. So this becomes a hallmark of the pro-Nicene tradition in the East and West, but, but this is the first time that a Latin that, that a Latin theologian um, does this. So, so, and, and this is another and this is another indication that Fabadius is in the vanguard of the of the pro-Nicene movement. The First instance of this middle positioning cites John 14 10 as proof that he does not teach, quote, as Sibelius did, that the Father and the Son are one person, nor as Arius did, that they are two substances, end quote. And the second instance comes from just before the summary of the Nicene faith that I just cited above, which exploits John 14 10. Even though his catchphrase for summarizing the Nicene faith is, well, is one substance and two persons, as John, as John 14.10 is the foundation on which he builds in order to get to that position. Even if it is not the case that John 14.10 and, and, and also mutual coherence um, play the central role that I have assigned them here, it is clear 
it, it's clear that his affirmation of one substance, one power, uh, and, um, and one divinity, um, for one honor, glory, and majesty, shared equally and eternally by the Father and Son, is intimately connected with this understanding of divine perfection um, and the mutual coherence of the Father and the Son. Conclusion. So the concept of substance may have served for Prabhadis as a kind of point of, of entry before articulating his doctrine of God, but it by no means it captures everything that he wants to, wants to say. Other concepts, such as power, better, better enable him to engage in the analytical work of explicating the unity of the Father and Son. But for bodies has adopted anti monarchy theological concepts that were developed by Tertullian and others in the third century, and he's adopted adapted them to function in a fourth century Nicene anti Aryan context. Now, this, so this adaptation is not without its problems, such as the presence side by side of, of these two different kind of power-based theologies. Um, and his defense of the Nicene faith ignores the wording of the Nicene Creed, uh, even as it insists on the category of substance in his account of divine unity. But then he has these synonymous concepts of power, power and divinity. Um, so, so it's not a seamless Nicene system, but as such is the birth of Latin Nicene theology. Thank you.